But the fact that we could take her down because she deserved to be taken down. She didn't qualify for the role in the first place. She has a perverse worldview that is deplorable and the sort of thing that we should not be supporting for people who are at the helm and shaping the minds of young people. This is a good thing. Hello, good people. It is Todd Shannon, data scientist, social commentator, getter of buckets, and today, well, yesterday, actually, we've got fantastic news. Cue the celebration. <laughs> Ding dong, the witch is dead. Claudine Gay, diversity hire extraordinaire, the chief diversity hire has been ousted, forced to resign from Harvard University, and this is cause for celebration, but I want to dive into why this is meaningful, why I think we should take a victory lap and also temper our enthusiasm just a bit because this win is mostly symbolic. Now, if you haven't been following this situation, uh, Claudine Gay, diversity hire, she's a obviously a diversity hire, and I'm going to show why that's true. She's been ousted because of her lack of ability to condemn clearly uh, uh, egregious and terrible comments calling for the genocide of Jews by pro-Hamas students and student groups. And she couldn't even say, yeah, they probably shouldn't be doing that. And so after that happened, uh, the first shooter drop was Liz McGill, who was UPenn's professor, another Ivy League professor. She was ousted almost immediately, forced to resign. But, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you, you know, the, 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 the golden calf of the black female in, on the left is hard to, it's hard to get rid of. Uh, Harvard backed her initially, but then the cavalry came in. People like Christopher Ruf Rufo basically put the squeeze on and uncovered a, basically an extensive history of Claudine Gay and her plagiarism in her former uh, published articles. And so that was really the straw that broke the camel's back. It really wasn't the blatant and immoral lack of condemnation of uh, Jewish genocide and calls for Jewish genocide that got her ousted, but rather the fact that she plagiarized um, on almost 50 occasions. And so that was really the straw that broke the camel's back. So what I want to do now is I want to take you through the history because as per usual, all of the usual left-wing uh, grifters and race hustlers are coming out of the woodworks and saying, oh, oh, she's only being ousted because she's a black woman and they wouldn't do that if she wasn't a black woman. Uh, chief among them, uh, Jamel Hill. Let's have a quick look. Here's Jamel Hill. When white people are hired in any position, the automatic assumption is they were the best person for the job. When, per when black people are hired, it's assumed that we got there because of affirmative action, which, by the way, doesn't mean underqualified. If affirmative action never existed, a lot of white people would still believe deeply in their own superiority because that's what they've been taught. <laughs> Considering there have been 30 presidents at Harvard and Claudine Gay was the only black one in history, she had to be extremely qualified to even be in that position. But don't let me interfere with your racism. Go off. All right, so this is the, this is the claim that she wasn't a diversity hire. All right, now let's look at the actual record here because this, this is quite fascinating. Uh, this is a post from N. Wokeness. Claudine Gay just resigned as Harvard president, the shortest tenure ever. Her career accomplishments, she wrote a total of 11 papers in her entire career. Now, apparently, I, I don't know what the rate of, of uh, you know, academic publication is generally for people with a doctorate, but this is apparently uh, quite a low number of publications. I have it on good authority. But so she wrote 11 papers in her entire career, six of them containing plagiarism, nearly all of them about race and gender. Also, she was a black woman. Now, somebody's going to say, well, that doesn't mean that she was underqualified. Um, yes, it does. <laughs> because when the extent of your academic uh, uh, pursuits or your, your publications and, your, and, and the things that you've accomplished in your career, when the extent of it is just that you, you, you wrote some papers about race and gender, and that's pretty much all you did. Uh, yeah, it does mean that for arguably the most prestigious uh, university in the United States, uh, one of the most prestigious in the world, if that's what got you qualified to run the entire organization, I think people are right to raise some questions about that. But I want to take this a step further because I want to compare and contrast Claudine Gay's academic 
and uh, and 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 career background with that of Liz McGill. Liz McGill, who was the first person forced to resign from the University of Pennsylvania, and she was really the ringleader because she's she's the one to introduce the idiotic uh, uh, concept that calling for genocide, whether or not that is wrong or, or worthy of condemnation, is context dependent. She definitely deserved uh, to uh, be uh, to face the guillotine. But look at Liz McGill. Now, so we'll, we'll look at, uh, now I realize that this is um, Wikipedia, so a little bit sus, but hey, for our purposes, I think we can get some good information out of this. So look at Liz, uh, Liz Miguel's career. Uh, from 1988 to 1992, she worked as a senior legislative assistant for the United States uh, uh, Senator of North Dakota, right? Following law school, McGill worked as a law clerk for Judge J. Harvey uh, Wilkinson the third on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit Court, right? Then from um, 1997 to 2012, she was a law professor at the University of Virginia. So she worked 15 years as a professor of law at the University School of uh, Virginia School of Law, which is apparently a fairly uh, prestigious uh, law school. From there, after a 15-year uh, career of teaching law at a, uh, a well-established university, she began to take on uh, senior administrative roles. From 2012 to 2019, she was the dean of the School of Law at Stanford University. Uh, that's a pretty prestigious outfit there. And then from 2019 to 2022, she served as provost at the University of Virginia. So she went back to the University of Virginia and served as Provost, and then and then she got the uh, the president job at UPenn uh, shortly thereafter. So hers was also a very short stint. Now let's compare this to Claudine Gay because this is <laughs> this is pretty this is pretty telling. Claudine Gay, also from Wikipedia, Gay was an assistant professor and later turned tenure associate professor at Stanford University's Department of Political Science. From 2000 to 2006, in 2003 2004 academic year, she was fellow of center, uh, fellow at the Center of Advanced Study on Behavioral Sciences. So from 2000, roughly 2004, around there, uh, 2006, from 2000 to 2006, she, she served in that role. She didn't get her first administrative role until 2015. But look at her... Uh, her, her research, it says, Gay's research addresses American political behavior, including voter turnout, housing policy, and policies of race and identity. She was recruited by Harvard to be a professor of government in 2006 and was appointed professor of African-American studies in 2007. So for those of you who don't know, African-American studies is like the definition of a fake if you have a degree in African American studies, then you basically have nothing, right? It's just below, like you know, lesbian dance theory and basket weaving. It's like it's just not a real thing. African American studies. So she is steeped in the DEI ideology. That's basically all she's been doing since two thousand and seven, working to you know basically ingratiate herself in wokeness. Two thousand fifteen, she became. Uh, um, she was named the Dean of Social Studies at Harvard uh, Faculty Arts and Scientists and the Wilbert A. Cowett Professor of Government in African American Studies. So let's just think about this. From 2007 until she became the president, the sole thing that she did, the, the sum total of her role in academia was in African American Studies. Versus something very rigorous, very competitive, something like law, which it looks to me that Claudine Gay actually had a, a shorter tenure in both her um, pursuits and her, her roles in African-American studies and administration. She, had nearly, she nearly had a shorter stint altogether before she became president than just Liz McGill's simply a pr professorial role as a professor of law at the University of Virginia, where she was professor of law for 15 years. So Liz McGill has a 25-year career where 
for 15 years, she taught law. And for 10, another 10 years, she had senior administrative roles at universities. But it just so happened that uh, Liz McGill isn't black. So she doesn't have the, uh, the magic pass. She doesn't have the, uh, the golden calf card where you can just skip all of the other rigorous achievements that you need to achieve. Not to mention the fact that Liz McGill published twice as many articles during that time than uh, Claudine Gay did. So not only was she uh, functioning in more rigorous and more difficult roles uh, based on the subject matter and the roles that she had being in senior leadership for at least 10 years, she also published more articles during that time in the area of law, not about race and gender, which is a fake and made up uh, area of study. So when we compare the two people, when we compare Claudine Gay to uh, uh, to Liz McGill, there's no comparison, right? Claudine Gay has a very paltry and very thin resume to ascend to the heights of the highest role at the University of Harvard, where that might be the most prestigious university we have in our nation. So the idea that she wasn't a diversity hire is just absurd, okay? But what I really want to get back to is I want to get back to this issue of uh, how she got ousted because there's a lot of people saying this is this is just uh, uh, you know the right they talk about cancel culture they say cancel culture is wrong cancel culture is bad we don't want more cancel culture so is this just cancel culture just flipped on its head is the right who often decries the evils of cancel culture now they're engaging in the very thing that they say that the left shouldn't do so I do have to say here there's a little bit of logical inconsistency here with many on the right, because many on the right would say, cancel culture is bad, but this is clearly how Claudine Gay got ousted. They put the pressure on her. The specific goal, let's just be clear about it, was to get her removed from that role. So the question is, well, well, was the thing that they did, was it warranted? And I would say that when you can't even say that calling for the genocide of Jewish people is wrong, you lack the moral leadership to be in a prestigious role like the president of the University of Harvard. You just you have just disqualified yourself whole cloth. Okay? Now, the other pursuits to uncover the plagiarism was really what got them over the top, but I want to deal with the concept of cancel culture because I'll just be I'll just be honest with you. Cancel culture is not wrong. And the cancel culture is kind of a pejorative term. It's kind of a term that I don't prefer to use. Some people say, well, it's accountability culture. I understand what they're trying to say. What they're trying to say is that you cannot have a functioning society, you cannot have a healthy society when people can do things that are evil without social consequence. That is 100% correct. So then the question is, well, then what's wrong with what these people have done? What's wrong with what we are complaining about on the left? And the answer to that question is, I think, actually pretty simple to answer. It's because... With the left, their objective is not really to rehabilitate people and to help people see the error of their race so they can be reintegrated back into society. There's no redemption path for people on the left. They just want to destroy people. And the reason why that is is because accountability culture really, and I, and I like to use this example because the church has its own quote-unquote accountability culture, if you want to call it cancel culture or what have you, where if you have a person participating in sin, and you go to that person and you ask them to repent and they refuse. And then you escalate that uh, accordingly, according to the scriptures. And they still don't repent. The Bible says that you should basically shun that person. They should be ostracized socially. They should not be, you shouldn't eat with them. You shouldn't uh, fellowship with them. And the objective here is to get this person to repent so that they can come back into fellowship with the body of Christ. And so that's the whole objective. The objective is to get them back into the fold. But there's a whole list of things that are also supporting that process, which is that, first of all, every person who engages in trying to get someone to turn from their own sin needs to recognize, recognize that they themselves are sinners and that they themselves will need the same grace and mercy that they might be uh, trying to extend to other people or that they need to extend to other people. So they need to be careful about that. And second of all, God himself requires that all these things be done with gentleness and meekness, considering your own selves. So you have in Christianity this whole apparatus 
of assume the assumed virtue of mercy and grace and gentleness and with a clear objective to bring someone back into the fold, not to destroy them, supporting the whole process of social ostracization when someone does the wrong thing and then redemption when they get back in line. But the left, and particularly the secular left, they have no such assumptions about the virtues of mercy and grace and the recognizing of their own personal sins or the hypocrisy that would be, would be uh, evident in the fact that if you tried to destroy someone permanently when you yourself might be guilty of the same thing that you're accusing other people of, they have no such uh, checks and balances. And so the whole apparatus undergirding the less version of cancel culture really doesn't have the, its uh, ultimate objective, true path of redemption and a true uh, 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 desire to see someone come back and to be redeemed and to come back into the fold after acknowledging their error. That's not the objective. So the real problem is, is that when wicked people who have a subverted sense of morality and a lack of priority of mercy and, and, and grace, when they have the gavel of justice, cancel culture doesn't work. When people have inverted and subverted morals, you can't have those people being the judges of those who have done wrong. The wicked do not understand justice, but the righteous understand it perfectly. So that's the very big difference between the two. So this is not hypocrisy when it comes to cancel culture, because I think that cancel culture as a, as a thing is a necessary thing for any healthy society. The only requirement is that there must be a focus on the path of redemption, or a focus on mercy, a focus on grace, and then obviously the penalties socially must be commensurate with whatever crime was committed or whatever uh, social norm was transgressed. If someone says something that's unpopular, that doesn't mean they should lose their job. You got people on the left literally asking for people who misgender a person who is delusional about their gender, that those people not be allowed to work and feed their family, that they be fired from their job and that they be dismissed from polite society while also advocating that grown men dressed as women in sexual and sensual garb be able to twerk in front of five-year-olds. Th those people shouldn't be at the helm of determining who should be out ousted uh, from cancel culture and then who should be within the realms of polite society. Those people shouldn't be the ones making those judgments because they clearly have a subverted moral compass. And so, uh, in short... Claudine Gay, her going down is a symbolic victory. It's a good victory. Uh, we should have no delusions about whether or not uh, the woke mind virus has been ousted from these universities or anything like that. Even Claudine Gay's resignation letter, uh, she was obstinate. She was still not really taking responsibility for what, what she did wrong. She refused to acknowledge that she shouldn't have basically uh, punted on absolutely condemning calls for genocide for the Jews. She just said, oh, you know, they're, they're, they're after me because of, uh, you know, with racial animus. So she's still playing the race card. But what we should celebrate is that the, it is possible for the golden calf of wokeness, the black female, uh, the, only, the only way she could have been uh, even more untouchable is if she was gay. And ironically, her last name being gay, I, I mean, frankly, uh, I... I almost assume she was gay. I mean, if you look at her, this look, woman looks like she's never made a sandwich in her life. Uh, she looks like she's got that classic feminist look, the androgynous look, the one that says, I hate my feminine attributes, and I'm going to downplay them at every point. Uh, you know, the, 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 the boyish haircut. It, it's, pretty, it's pretty bad. But the only way she could have been higher on the oppression totem pole is if she was gay. And the fact that she had the last name gay, I, I think at least projected some of those vibes, you know what I'm saying? But the fact that we could take her down because she deserved to be taken down, she didn't qualify for the role in the first place, she has a perverse worldview that is deplorable and the sort of thing that we should not be supporting for people who are at the helm and shaping the minds of young people, this is a good thing. Once again. <laughs> Claudine Gay is out. Let me know what your thoughts are. I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. Uh, if you think this was a good thing, um, I certainly think it does, but uh, we've got a lot more work to do. So till next time, friends, God bless you.